Hola a todos. Bienvenidos. Pueblo Santo en Jesucristo. Gloria a Dios. All right. Praise God. Uh, there was a couple of other things I wanted to go over for the book of Daniel and specifically for that uh, chapter 11, Capitulo 11. If you're teaching the Bible, this is a good one for history. It is Josephus, translated by William Whiston. And you can get this for around $20. It's got four books in it that Josephus, the Jewish historian, wrote. So it's got his biography, The Wars of the Jews, the antiquities. So the wars of the Jews was done like within five or six years from the fall of Jerusalem and the temple at 70 AD. Antiquities is done 20 years later. And you'll see how James, the brother of Jesus was killed. There was a couple of things where Josephus, the Jewish historian is talking about Daniel and where he's speaking of that battle that we were talking about that last battle the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, where Egypt being led with Cleopatra and Mark Anthony against Rome, and they are wheeling back strong and coming at them. And there was land battles and many ships. Well, many ships, you're talking about 700. But I'm gonna go over a couple of pages that I think might be helpful to us in the study. The reason that the Battle of Actium I see is important because Daniel was talking about Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, and Rome, and then that coming of the King, Jesus Christ. He is King, praise God. Isn't that awesome? And that battle, really, after that battle, it's where Octavian becomes Caesar Augustus. So you had Julius Caesar first, then Octavian, who's an adopted son, and then the son of deity, because they start claiming deity at that point. And they're about dividing the land and the fortresses, their power of their might, and the valuables, and taking your taxes to Rome. So as long as you're going with that program. But, you know, the reason God had paved the way for these things is because he was paving the way for the King Jesus Christ. Concerning the Battle of Actium, Caesarea, and the temple that was for Caesar at Caesarea, it was between the sea and the Holy Hill, which would be the Holy Hill of Zion, uh, that would be the city of David. So let's look at Josephus the Wars of the Jews, Book 1, Chapter 20. All right, so we have King Herod, who had been friend of Mark Anthony. Well, he's humbly going to Octavian, who is Caesar Augustus, the illustrious one. And Josephus writes, However, the king, and that's Herod the Great, resolved to expose himself to dangers. Accordingly, he sailed to Rhodes, where Caesar then abode. So Rhodes was an island uh, under Turkey there. And came to him without his diadem. So without his crown, he came to him. And in the habit and appearance of a private person, but in his behavior as a king, so he concealed nothing of the truth, but spake thus before his face. O Caesar, as I was made king of the Jews by Anthony. So remember, he had been made king of the Jews by Anthony, and Anthony was leading in power under Julius Caesar before. So do I profess that I have used my royal authority in the best manner, and entirely for his advantage. So remember, his advantage, he was actually fighting against Octavian with Cleopatra the seventh, right? nor will I conceal this farther, that thou hast certainly found me in arms and in inseparable companion of his, had not the Arabians hindered me. However, I sent him as many auxiliaries as I was able and many ten thousands cory of corn. So grains he was sending and foods to Mark Anthony and Cleopatra as they were fighting against Rome. 
Nay, indeed, I did not desert my benefactor after the bow that was given him at Actium. So here he's describing Actium, and that was for the Battle of Actium at 31 BC. But I gave him the best advice I was able when I was no longer able to assist him in the war. And I told him that there was but one way of recovering his affairs, and that was to kill Cleopatra. And I promised him that if she were once dead, I would afford him money and walls for his security with an army and myself to assist him in his war against thee. But his affections for Cleopatra stopped his ears, as did God himself also, who hath bestowed the government on thee. So that's interesting, you know, how even Herod the Great is recognizing that God was bestowing this government on Octavian Caesar Augustus. I own myself also to be overcome together with him, and with this last fortune I have laid aside my diadem. So with, with this, he is laying aside his crown, and am come hither to thee, having my hopes of safety in thy virtue. So his hopes for any safety, he's putting towards this new king, this Caesar. And I desire that thou wilt first consider how faithful a friend and not whose friend I have been. Well, this is really kind of interesting too because this is in a way, it's, it's like repentance. You know, here he is. He knew, knew he did wrong. He has been supplying somebody in battles that he should not have been supplying weapons of warfare and everything for their support to do the wrong battle, right? And so it's kind of like a Christian. We are called to repent. In Revelations 2 and 3, when Jesus is talking to the churches, he tells the churches seven times, repent and overcome or conquer. You know, we're commanded to repent. And here we see Herod the Great, the one who actually was trying to kill anybody, trying to stop him from being king that was bestowed on him from above um, by the Caesars. They'd bestowed him to be king of the Jews. But the one who's really the king of the Jews, Jesus Christ, was come. You know, 30 years later, Jesus the King is coming, praise God, at this time of Rome. Everything was being paved for that. When Caesar had spoken such obliging things to the king and had put the diadem again about his head, he proclaimed what he had bestowed on him by a decree in which he enlarged the commendation of the man after a magnificent manner. Go up a little farther. After this, Caesar went for Egypt through Syria when Herod received him with royal and rich entertainments, and then did he first of all ride along with Caesar, as he was reviewing his army about Ptolemaeus. Okay, so that city, you will see that city where Paul was on that city when he was going on his journeys, he would be there. This was a city where even uh, the Roman, there were Romans, there were Jews there, uh, retired military. And also, this is where Vespasian and Titus actually came in through that city at the Jewish rebellion uh, in 66 AD to try to stop the rebellion that was going on so they could save the city and the temple. And feasted him with all his friends, and then distributed among the rest of the army what was necessary to feast them with all. He also made a plentiful provision of water for them when they were to march as far as Pelusium. So they were going to march down to Egypt. Pelusium is in Egypt. Through a dry country, which he did also in like manner, and their return thence. Nor were there any necessaries wanting to that army. It was therefore the opinion of both Caesar and of his soldiers that Herod's kingdom was too small for those generous presents he made them. For which reason, when Caesar was come into Egypt and Cleopatra and Anthony were dead. Now remember, they both did suicide in 31 BC is when they did suicide. He did not only bestow 
other marks of honor upon him, but made an addition to his kingdom by giving him not only the country which had been taken from him by Cleopatra, but beside that Gadara, Hippo, Samaria, moreover of the maritime cities Gaza and Anthedon and Joppa and Stratos Tower. So Stratos Tower, that's where he's going to make Caesarea. Caesarea sounds like Caesar, right? Well, it's dedicated to the Caesar, Caesar Augustus. He also made him a present of 400 Gauls. Okay, so the Galatian guard, as a guard for his body, which they had been to Cleopatra before. So that's, that's interesting. And I believe Herod actually used those Gauls to kill somebody that was going to be the high priest at one time later on. And I think if I remember right, he said, go dip him in some water. So, oh, they dipped him a little bit too long. He never came up. Uh, so that's kind of crazy. All right. Now we'll go farther up in chapter 21, the Jewish Wars, book one, chapter 21. So this is where King Herod, he builds for his friends and country. So Herod, you know, he's one who really built up the temple. He built up the cities and Antonia by the temple. Now Antonia, that's actually named after Mark Anthony also. A royal palace, which he called Antonia in honor of Antony. He also built himself a palace in the upper city containing two very large and most beautiful apartments to which the holy house itself could not be compared in largeness. The one apartment he called Caesarium. So after Caesar, so this is his great friend now, and the other Agrippium for his two great friends. So Herod the Great, he has family that are named after Agrippa. So Marcus Agrippa, he is the key to the Battle of Actium strategically, 31 BC Battle of Actium with Octavian. And the reason he was so strategic strategic and good for Octavian is because one, he's not a man who needed to take the credit. He let all the credit go to Octavian. And two, he had great strategy by going down south, cutting off the supplies before they engaged in a battle. And also that he did not go into the trap. And so they did the land battles they needed to do ahead of time and then were ready to where Cleopatra and Mark Anthony, they had to go out of their strategic place to start the battle, which was out of their favor. So very wise. Um, and God, I'm sure God arranged this thing so it would work for Rome to become a power, paving the way for Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the King. So Herod builds Caesarea uh, with that temple for Caesar. So that's where, you know, Noten, when you're reading Josephus, where and you're going back to Daniel and you're looking at uh, that they would plant themselves between the sea and the holy mount so that Jerusalem and the sea and right there you have a city to Caesar Augustus and a temple so here we have Stratos Tower Sebastos Harbor Sebastos that's Greek for Augustus like I said south of Dora along the coast and when he observed that there was a city by the seaside that was much decayed, its name was Stratos Tower, but that the place by the happiness of its situation was capable of great improvements from his liberality, he rebuilt it all with white stone and adorned it with several most splendid palaces wherein he especially demonstrated his magnanimity. For the cause was this, that all the seashore between Dora and Joppa, in the middle between which this city is situated, had no good haven, insomuch that everyone that sailed from Phoenicia from Egypt, remember it's all about trade, isn't it? What do you think the wars are going on now? Trade, uh, control, and all these battles, because people want to be the collectors of the money for it, right? So from Phoenicia for Egypt was obliged to lie in the stormy sea by reason of the south winds that threatened them, which wind, if it blew but a little fresh, such vast waves are raised and dash upon the rocks, that upon their retreat the sea is in a great ferment for a long way. But the king, by the expenses he was at, so King Herod, 
and the liberal disposal of them overcame nature and built a haven larger than was the Priam at Athens. Can you imagine that? Here King Herod is building something uh, to rival what was in Athens. And in the inner retirement of the water, he built other deep stations for the ships also. Skip up a little bit. And over against the mouth of the haven, upon an elevation, there was a temple for Caesar, which was excellent, both in beauty and largeness. And therein was a colossus of Caesar, not less than that of Jupiter Olympus. So that is pretty ma amazing, isn't it, to see that? And that's where, yeah, Daniel really kind of tips us off to this, which it was made to resemble. The other Colossus of Rome was equal to that of Juno at Argos. So he dedicated the city to the province and the haven to the sailors there. But the honor of the building he ascribed to Caesar and named it Caesarea accordingly. Wow, that is pretty amazing, isn't it? So that kind of, I don't know, for me, it kind of showed me some things that that end of Daniel 11 could be speaking of. Okay, the other place I wanted to take us to would be the books of Josephus. So we'll look in the Antiquities of the Jews, and that would be book 10, chapter 11, and then uh, down on paragraph Seven. He's a Jewish priest on both sides of his family. He was there at the fall of Jerusalem. He saw what was going on. So let's see uh, how he was viewing this uh, when it comes to the book of Daniel. But it is fit to give an account of what this man did, which is most admirable to hear. For he was so happy as to have strange revelations made to him and those as to one of the greatest of the prophets. Insomuch that while he was alive, he had the esteem and applause both of the kings and of the multitude. And now he is dead. He retains a remembrance that will never fail. For the several books that he wrote and left behind him are still read by us till this time. And from them, we believe that Daniel conversed with God. For he did not only prophesy of future events, as did the other prophets, but he also determined the time of their accomplishment. And while the prophets used to foretell misfortunes, and on that account were disagreeable both to the kings and to the multitude, Daniel was to them a prophet of good things, and this to such a degree that by the agreeable nature of his predictions he procured the goodwill of all men, and by the accomplishment of them. He procured the belief of their truth. Well, that's interesting. So even men that were not Jews were reading these books. Because remember, now Daniel's a little bit different because he's in foreign countries, not in Jerusalem. He's taken out of Jerusalem. He's in Babylon, and then he's in Persia. And he is prophesying about events with nations uh, that were going to rise and fall and the coming of the one who would have a kingdom without end. All right, but by people believing that and seeing that, wow, what this guy said was coming to pass, and they had seen it in their lifetime, so they were believing. And the opinion of all sort of divinity for himself. Among the multitude, he also wrote and left behind him what made manifest the accuracy and undeniable veracity of his predictions. For he saith, that when he was in Susa, the metropolis of Persia, and went out into the field with his companions, there was on the sudden a motion and concussion of the earth, and that he was left alone by himself, his friends flying away from him, and that he was disturbed and fell on his face and on his two hands, and that a certain person touched him, and at the same time bade him rise. And remember, you know, there were times where Daniel needed to be touched and strengthened so he could hear what the Lord was speaking to him, right? And see what would befall his countrymen after many generations. He also related that when he stood up, he was shown a great ram with many horns growing out of his head, and that the last was higher than the rest. 
And after this, he looked to the west and saw a he goat carried through the air from that quarter that he rushed upon the ram with violence and smote him twice with his horns and overthrew him to the ground and trampled upon him that afterwards he saw a very great horn growing out of the head of the he goat and that when it was broken off, four horns grew up that were exposed to each of the four winds. And he wrote that out of them arose another lesser horn, which as he said, waxed great. And that God showed to him that it should fight against his nation and take their city by force and bring the temple worship to confusion and forbid the sacrifices to be offered for 1,296 days. Daniel wrote that he saw these visions in the plain of Susa, and he hath informed us that God interpreted the appearance of this vision after the following manner. He said that the rams signified the kingdoms of the Medes and the Persians, and the horns those things that were to reign in them, and that the last horn signified the last king, and that he should exceed all the kings in riches and glory, that the he-goat signified the one should come and reign from the Greeks, who should twice fight with the Persian, and overcome him in battle, and should receive his entire dominion. Well, that was Alexander the Great that did that, right? That by the great horn which sprang out of the forehead of the he-goat was meant the first king, and that the springing up of four horns upon its falling off, and the conversion of every one of them to the four quarters of the earth signified the successors that should arise after the death of the first king and the partition of the kingdom among them and that they should be neither his children nor his kindred that should reign over the habitable earth for many years and that from among them there should arise a certain king that should overcome our nation and their laws and should take away our political government and should spoil the temple and forbid sacrifices to be offered for three years time. And indeed, it so came to pass that our nation suffered these things under Antiochus Epiphanes, according to Daniel's vision. Well, that's interesting right there that he identifies, you know, the little horn as Antiochus Epiphanes. And what he wrote many years before they came to pass. In the very same manner, Daniel also wrote concerning the Roman government and that our country should be made desolate by them. All these things did this man leave in writing, as God had showed them to him, insomuch that such as read his prophecies and see how they have been fulfilled. So he's seeing this as something that has been fulfilled, these things, these prophetic things of Daniel that would wonder at the honor wherewith God honored Daniel and may thence discover how the Epicureans are in an error, who cast providence out of human life, and do not believe that God takes care of the affairs of the world, nor that the universe is governed and continued in being by that blessed and immortal nature, but says that the world is carried along of its own accord without a ruler and a curator, which, were it destitute of a guide to conduct, as they imagine, it would be like ships without pilots, which we see drowned by the winds, or like chariots without drivers, which are overturned. So would the world be dashed to pieces by its being carried without a providence, and so perish and come to naught, so that by the forementioned predictions of Daniel, those men seem to be very much to err from the truth, who determine that God exercises no providence over human affairs. For if that were the case, that the world went on by mechanical necessity, we should not see that all things would come to pass according to his prophecy. Now as to myself, I have so described these matters as I have found them and read them. But if anyone is inclined to another opinion about them, let him enjoy his different sentiments without any blame from me. Well, that's really interesting. I thought that might be helpful for you in looking at Daniel, and let's leave off with uh, John chapter 3. Now John, that's the book where in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Praise God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father, that they are one. 
There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. See, they are witness of these things that they have seen. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Wow, I got to read that again. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Wow, amazing. Now, isn't it amazing, like I said before, when the ladies went to the tomb, they saw it was empty. The angel spoke to them. They went back and they told the men. Now, Peter, he did run to the tomb. <laughs> and, but the men were like, they were not wanting to believe. And the risen Christ calls them foolish. And he kind of chews them out. But then what he does is he is opening their self up to the prophets. What the word of God was saying. What the spirit of God was saying through the prophets like Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, and all the minor prophets. And it was being opened to them. So it doesn't matter how much a person knows the word. You can be a rabbi. that You can read every word there. You can know every word. Even the devil knows the word. But you have to have Jesus Christ open the word to you. And if Jesus Christ opens the word to you, you will know that Jesus is the Christ. He is the king that God has sent for his kingdom. The one that would last for eternity. That's why Jesus sent men to and fro to go out and that knowledge would increase. That knowledge of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. So God bless you. You know what? We are loved greatly by God. And by that love, he who first loved us, we can love one another and grow in him. And continue faithfully until that last day when Jesus comes back. And he is the one that will bring a judgment of fire so that the devil will be thrown into the lake of fire and everything else that is not of God. You know, unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. And God is the one who built the house. You are precious stones built together as that temple of God to continue to have God dwelling in you so you can have joy even while in persecution. And when you step over to that other through the Spirit, and He will give us new bodies, and He will say, Well done, good and faithful servants. Enter the joy of your Lord. Amen. God bless you in the name of Jesus.